Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for another very special edition of Wowza Live with our host, Ned Dennison. Ned? Hello, everyone. I'm the chairperson of the International Marathon Swimming Hall of Fame. We have another one of our honorees as a guest today, Michelle Macy from Portland, Oregon. Michelle, please say hello. Hi, thanks for having me, you guys. Michelle, in looking through your record, it looks like this uh, Pennock Island swim in Alaska it looks to be one of your first true marathon swims. I'm jealous. It's always a swim I wanted to do. Did you do anything significant before Pennock? Uh, I mean, I did a five mile across Minnesota Lake Minnetonka, and that was kind of my uh, test to see if I could do a little bit of distance. <laughs> and then um, Pennock was really the first true marathon swim that was cold water. We, we interviewed uh, Bruckner Chase uh, geez, probably two months ago. He, uh, he kind of uh, ate your lunch on that swim in 2007, uh, but you went back and, uh, and, and evened it up in 2008, it looks like. Um, yes. how, important, how important was that to you? You know, um, I, early on, I did a little bit more concentration on racing in marathon swimming because I came from a pool competitor and it's kind of hard to turn that off when you're in the water. Um, you just sort of think that you're supposed to be racing and Bruckner is a fantastic and fast swimmer. And so I think there was a little bit of me the following year that wanted to go back and definitely um, do better than I had the previous year, so. And and you had the privilege of swimming with James Pitar as well in 2007. Oh what were what were your impressions of uh, the challenges that he faced? You know, he is an incredibly talented swimmer, and I mean, honestly, the way he's adapted with his um, different ability, you wouldn't really know in the water that he is blind or has something else going on. Um, he and his kayaker had a wonderful partnership, and it just—it was so amazing just to swim with him. You wouldn't even know. He's so generous and so kind, and uh, shared so many learnings just from his experience that I could adapt and take on as my own. So it was really a blessing to be able to swim with him as well as his kayaker, Matt, at the time. Um, I learned a lot about how a crew person it really is that partnership and that you both succeed together or you both fail together. I swam with them in, in Ireland, but they only had the two signals. Like left was one tweet of the whistle, yeah. right was two tweets of the whistle. But in Alaska, you had the three tweets, which was the polar bear and the fourth tweet, which was the orcas. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, we didn't really have to worry about polar bears, but um, we did have you do have to worry about the whales for sure and the sea lions which are huge but as far as i know um that event we only had the one tweet and the two tweets and he did great okay all right um at what point did um ocean sevens become your focus um i think it came about uh when ocean seven steven created that in about 2009 and at that point um when I saw the list, I had already had about three of the swims and quite a, and of course I already had my long bucket list of marathon swims that I wanted to complete. And I noticed there was a lot of overlap. So I figured, well, if they're already on my list and they're now on the Ocean 7 list, why not give it a go? Um, so I think there was only one swim that wasn't on my own list that ended up on Steven on the Ocean Seven list. So I just was like, okay, let's let's give it a shot. And then from that point on, it sort of became my focus of those were the swims that I was going after first for my bucket list. So you you separated the bucket list into Steve's swims and the rest. Correct. Correct. You um you became the third to complete the Ocean Sevens. Thank you very much. Yeah. And congratulations. Uh, Thank before you. before Attila Manioki, you had the uh, the fastest time, but not to worry, you still hold the overall North Channel record, male and female, and the I female do. records for Subaru Anna uh, Kappa around Jersey and Jersey to France. So, you, um, did you set out to to take these records, or did it just kind of happen, or was your crew screaming, "Pick it up! You're you're one minute ahead of pace," or something? 
No, um, I don't think actually for the Subaru, I own the record anymore. I think Nora Toledano took it from me in a whipping fast time. Um, so I'm not sure I have that one anymore. Um, but no, I, you know, after I sort of got my um, rear end handed to me and learned more about marathon swimming, like from Bruckner Chase and when I did MIMS and learned that perhaps taking the competitive pool mindset into the open water was really not beneficial to me. I started to just, um, my crew and I came up with a mantra that works for me, which is just to have a safe and relaxed swim. And if I can focus on that, the rest of it comes. If there's a good time, there's a good time. If there's not there and I complete it, that's great. So there was never, um, First, I, I never even thought about trying to have the fastest overall cumulative time. Um, I didn't even know that was going to be a thing. And honestly, like two of the Ocean 7 I did as tandem swims, which as you know, are very different types of swims than just going straight out, flat out. Um, we knew with some of the swims, my crew and I, that I'd be close potentially to the record. Um, but again, the mantra was always have a safe and relaxed swim. And if if the record came, the record came. Um, so it was never really a goal to go out to break records. Um, it, it was more to go out and have a great, enjoyable experience. And ultimately, if I could stay in that mantra, usually it resulted in a successful swim as well. Not always. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting contrast. If you've listened to some of the other interviews, the, uh, the, the FINA professional uh, men and women they don't talk about swimming the English Channel. They talk about the race. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and and they, you know, they and many of them definitely came to those kinds of swims to 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 put down the time to break a record. And it's funny they don't talk about the swim. They talk about the race. Well, I've always been a pretty average swimmer, um, so I never really thought records or speed was an, sort of in my repertoire. Um, and I think that I'm learning that perhaps in open water swimming, I'm better than average, although I wouldn't say that now. Um, uh, so I guess I never really thought of that as uh, how I identify myself as a racer. It's more of like um, me against myself and the elements and controlling what I can control and trying to manage what I can't. Well, I can, I can assure you in the world of traditional marathon swimming, uh, when you've completed the Ocean 7s, it puts you in the, the top kind of point something 1%. And then when you, uh, when you, you lay down a few fast times, you, you creep up a little bit. So don't, don't sell yourself too short on that, uh, on that uh, accomplishment side. Well, thank you so much. It was, it, it's still something that's a little hard to um, reconcile with how I view myself. So. Which of the um, solo swims did you enjoy or enjoy the most? You know, there's a few that I've gone back to from the Ocean 7. Well, actually, I had to go back to a lot of them because I um, didn't, I was, as you probably know, besides having the, well, having the cumulative fastest for a little while, I also have the most failures in the Ocean 7 um, as well. Uh, so, I've had to go back to quite a few swims. Um, I really enjoy the atmosphere and the community that have uh, formed around some of these more um, historical swims like the English Channel and the North Channel. Um, I, I think there's only really one of the Ocean Seven that I wouldn't go back to and it was the one that wasn't on my bucket list to begin with. <laughs> but um, it's not because of the community or anything, it's just, uh, the water sets me off. So, Japan, or, Japan or the Cook Strait? No, neither of those. It's actually Molokai. Okay. All right. It's, you know, once you get away from those little islands, you really, really are in wild water. And it's where I got my scuba certification. So I also have seen very, very big, scary fish. Wildlife. Wildlife. Wildlife in uh that water so and i have a very high irrational fear of sharks so it's it's 
that one is very mentally was and is very mentally challenging. I had to go back to it. So I failed once and then I had to go back. Um, and mentally that one was really hard to get my head wrapped around. And additionally, it's also quite warm water for me. And I just um, don't do well in that kind of temperature. I mean, they were put shoving my feeds at the bottom of an ice cooler to cool them off so that I could keep going and cool down. You were probably fortunate that you did the swim right before multiple drones came into effect. Oh, thank God. <laughs> I go, sure Don't worry, Michelle. Don't worry, Michelle. There's only six tiger sharks a mile away headed your way at an incredible yeah. speed. I got there fast. <laughs> I know the drones, It's there's benefits for a lot of it. So my crew has a, a rule if they know of a shark and just don't tell me unless I absolutely have to know and it's a get out of the water situation. If I don't recognize it and don't see it, don't tell me. Um, the other good thing that drones keeps my ass off of the video. <laughs> so um, there are a whole lot of good things about not having drones on my swim. It, it's for anybody that's listening who hasn't instructed their crew or is going to be crewing for somebody. There's a couple of really bad things a crew can do. One of the bad things that you can do is they can all point to something. Yes. It could be oh it could gosh. be a mermaid. It could be a floating chest of treasure. It could be a pile of garbage. But when six people on the boat are all pointing at something, it's really bad for a swimmer's head. Yeah. So that happened in uh, Gibraltar. Um, the, we had the small little Zodiac and the Zodiac pilot and my crew person and I was doing it as a tandem. We're looking on the other side of the boat and you start to see their head tracking towards where we are swimming. And I'm like, oh, this isn't going to be good. Um, so I pop up and all my crew person says is, it's okay. They're not going to eat you. And it was these pilot, you know, whales or, um, and they just, I mean, they were right there in front of us. And I'm like, they might not eat us, but man, they're big. And it came up and the water moved away and took a look at us. And I like got pushed back when it tail went down. And I'm like, this is, this is nuts. <laughs> this is nuts. But you yes. Didn't have, you didn't have to pay extra for that. I did not. I know. Oh, okay. it, was a win, right. it was a win for me once I was able to get my heart rate back down. One of the events you took place, uh, you took part in, which um, I had I'd originally looked at but couldn't make it, was the uh, the three-way uh, lake swim in New Zealand. Oh my uh, gosh, you were, amazing. You were, you were swimming with honorees Penny Palfrey and Dr. Julie Bradshaw. Um, took you guys kind of two plus days. Um, when I speak to the, the men involved in it, um, they, uh, they pretty much knew they owned you ladies the entire way, men versus women. How competitive was that swim for you, particularly in the last couple of hours? Um, I think in the last couple of hours is when we started to realize that there was, uh, we were really close. Um, and, you know, we were tired and we wanted to do what we could. So we were definitely watching the changing of positions um, back and forth towards that end. We were, we were so close, so close. It was, it was like, you know, more than a minute, I mean. Yeah, I think it was the three minute time difference over 33 hours. So that's yeah. pretty, uh, pretty impressive that we've managed to keep that uh, close to each other, but it made it so much more fun because the boats were close and, you know, we got to do a little bit more interacting. Um, but really, ultimately, everyone was really super supportive of each other on that swim, whether we were behind by a little bit or in front. And they didn't own us the whole time. Those boys. <laughs> uh, you've, had a, you've had a bit of a world tour. Give us your, your travel highlights. Travel highlights. Oh, my gosh. I would go back, really, Ned, to any of the swims that I've done, except maybe Molokai. And I would go back to do swims in Hawaii, just because the community there is so impressive. But um, I never thought that I would get to Asia, even though it was on my list of places to go um, before I became a marathon swimmer. And um, marathon swimming has really provided me the opportunity to travel to places that I never thought I would go see and get involved with um, the community that I didn't know existed that is so warm and welcoming. Um, it's been a real blessing for me 
you know, I've been to Lake Titicaca, I've been to Japan more than once now. And um, yeah, my bucket list, you would think would start getting shorter, but it seems like every time I hear something like you're doing or someone else, I'm like, oh, that one looks good. Or whenever you see a picture of a lake now, I'm sure every, a lot of marathon swimmers doing that, they're like, can I, I wonder if I could swim that and has somebody swim it and how do I make that happen? So I think it's a good thing that the world is 70% or whatever percent water because it's good for us. We've got a lot of places to travel to. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Um, any advice if somebody came to you who, who hadn't done any of the Ocean Sevens and said they, they're, they, they're going to dedicate the next few years to it, what advice would you give them? Oof. Save up your money. <laughs> <laughs> what, is it, what, is, what, is it, what does it cost? Uh, for me, most of my swims cost anywhere between seven and 10 grand. Um, and that's because of, and that's just to the swim. That's not the training and all the stuff that leads into being healthy um, for a swim. But that is because travel is usually expensive. I usually um, budget to pay for my crew members to come along as well because they're giving up their holiday time to do something to support me accommodations, boats. Um, it's a really quite expensive sport, um, which, so there's that, that, and then it really does change your lifestyle. You have to really focus your lifestyle on it, or at least that's what I had to do, you know, was work, swim, and working to pay the bills and pay for the swims, but then also everything that wasn't working to pay the bills and the swims was really focused on how do I go into the swims and be as healthy mentally, physically, and spiritually as possible to be successful. And obviously, as I said, I'm, I've got the most failures of all the Ocean 7 as well. And you're going to need a, a good group of friends who are going to support you in your crazy endeavors. Um, and understand that when you want to go to bed at seven at night, that it's because you're getting up at four in the morning to get a couple hours of swimming in or dry land training. Um, and I'm a big, big advocate of physical therapy for your shoulders and stuff to keep them healthy, even if you don't have problems now, because you might, because you're going to be jamming the heck out of them. Then there's swim training. And then the, I do cross training as well. So like yoga, Pilates, uh, weight training. Um, sometimes I'll do rowing machine. Um, when I was in the heavy training mode of getting, trying to get through the ocean seven. So, I mean, it's a full, it's kind of a full-time job in its own right. If you can get sponsorship, amazing. <laughs> I, I wasn't able to finagle that, but yeah. So plan, I would say plan seven to 10 K per swim. You can do it cheaper, but. I, I would say plan for a hundred thousand U.S. dollars. Um, your uh, yes. you described you described the sport as expensive. I would say the Ocean Sevens is expensive, but the the tan line you have on your forehead, you, you <laughs> got by swimming in the local river. How much how much did it cost you to do that that training swim, Michelle? Oh, let's see. Well, first I've been the last five years for me have been a struggle. I've had some health issues and some. Ment physical and mental um, health issues that have caused some problems for me. So first I had to find a swimsuit big enough to fit this new body that I have. Um, so, you know, a couple hundred bucks finding one that fit all the jiggly bits. And then um, the passes to get down to the river for a year pass was 40 bucks. So, and a tow float and a whistle. So for safety. Um, so you can do it for under a hundred. 200 bucks, I'd say. There you go. Get Mine out is, into uh, the lakes and the rivers right around here for sure. My, my commute is about four kilometers and there's, there's no cost to swim. Yeah. Um, a, little bit, a little bit of grease and some uh, washing up liquid um, detergent yes. for the goggles afterwards. That's pretty inexpensive. When I last checked, you had raised over $50,000 for breast cancer research. What's your, what's your current total? How did you go about it? And what, what special meaning does it have for you? 
Well, the special meaning is, uh, I would say my first like real quote, I mean, the panic, yes, is a real marathon swim. It is 8.6 miles, but when the first of the big ones, I didn't do Catalina before I went to the English channel and I went straight to the English channel because I didn't know that I was going to be in love with this. Um, but six weeks before my first English channel swim, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer and it's uh, prominent in my mom's family. So quite a few of her sisters have had breast cancer and my grandmother had breast cancer. And when I came out of the closet, so to speak, of like, I'm going to do this marathon swim, I didn't tell people until three months before I left for the English Channel. People started donating money uh, to support me. And I felt um, that I had already budgeted for the English Channel. So I took the money and thought, well, there's a way I can give back to um, the breast cancer research community. And I had worked in the labs there when I first left the university. And so I called up the University of Minnesota Cancer Center. Um, all of the money that I would be raising would be going towards uh, doctors being able to get a little bit of seed money to do a little bit of research, then to apply for grants to get more money because operational costs are all covered by the University of Minnesota. So I sort of set the goal. I think that first year to, I donated about $2,000 and I was like, well, you know, I'm Doing, now I love this sport and people are kind of getting behind me. Why don't I set a goal of raising $50,000? Um, never one to start small. Um, <laughs> type A personality. It took me probably eight years to do it. It was about two grand every year that I raised. Um, it was another full-time job um, on top of the training and you send letters, you write blog posts, you... Um, I would send fundraising letters to everyone and um, try to do media to raise awareness for it. But once I reached $50,000, I sort of uh, took a step back from uh, adding, I know it sounds horrible to say it was a stressor, but it was kind of an added stress. Um, and so I, I think probably I'm still around $50,000. I haven't really focused that much of energy on that component as much. But you, um, you, you followed uh, Steve Moon and Tonis and to a small extent myself in creating a bucket list recently. So Steve has, uh, no one knows this, but Steve has created a lot of bucket lists. It's like that yes. movie where the guy throws the spaghetti against the wall and sees if it will stick. Yes. Now, a, a couple of them, like the, the Triple Crown and the Ocean Sevens, have been tremendously successful. Yes. I, he's had a fair few that only I've ever heard of and not a single other person in the world ever knew he created. And yeah. I did the triple break, which has been uh, a little bit, a little bit working. You've created the Stillwater Eight. Tell us about it. Uh, tell us about each of them and, um, and why. Oof. Now you're going to see if I can remember them all. So it wasn't just me really who created this. Um, I was in uh, Tarifa getting ready and waiting for the wind to cooperate at the Strait of Gibraltar. And there was a, some other marathon swimmers there. And we were, we were talking about the Ocean Seven and kind of, you know, joking and laughing and isn't that crazy? And how did it get created? And well, those are all ocean swims. What if we do lake swims? So we just started throwing out ideas and then we said, well, it, what would we call it? And again, going along the lines of what Stephen had created with um, Ocean Seven is Stillwater Eight. And you know, I posted it on my blog with sort of a tongue-in-cheek play on what Stephen was doing with the Ocean Seven. Didn't really know if it was going to take off or not. Um, again, you need branding and marketing and to put energy around that. And um, so uh, let's see. We have the look original. At the look, look, look at the chat hint. I know I put I'm, them seeing, on the I'm chat. seeing this, but now <laughs> I'm going to look down and away from the thing. So when we first did it, we were looking for iconic lake swims that were over 10K. And um, we leveraged Lynn Cox, obviously a pioneer in marathon swimming, and what she had done. And we tried to get one on each continent. Um, and so the original list was Windermere, um, Lake Bacall in Russia, um, Zurich, uh, 
uh, I'm trying to look at uh, Loch Ness, uh, Taupo, not Taupo, Tahoe. Um, and we had one of the Great Lakes, which I'm forgetting, Ontario, I think. Um, so we found out that as it started to take off, as people have completed the Ocean 7, I think some, there are some people who need to have, um, maybe don't have their own bucket list that is huge, but like to have challenges to go for, like, uh, you know, if I've swum the English Channel, now I'm going to try and go do an Ironman and, you know, get the M dot. So some people like to have the challenges set up for them. Um, people started to go after the Stillwater 8 and uh, quickly realized and reached out to the leadership community and influencers in marathon swimming that some of the swims that we had on there were um, really probably impossible uh, to do just from an organizational perspective. Additionally, Lake Windermere had so many different ways that you could swim it, whether uh, there were not necessarily different routes, but different organizations running it, different gear that you could wear, what constituted it. So, um, and we knew it was an iconic swim in its own right, and that people would go do that swim regardless. So we replaced Lake Bokal in Russia, which from an organizational perspective, at least for people, for sure in the US, it's really, really difficult to get visas and be able to even travel over to Russia, let alone then try to organize a swim there because there is no association. Um, we replaced uh, Lake Bacall and Windermere with two other iconic swims that had uh, organizations that were either being formed or going to be formed around them. So now I believe the eight are Loch Ness, um, which again, these most of these have pretty set routes, set rules. And if they don't, we're using the Marathon Swimmers for uh, forum rules, federation rules uh, that have been set up. So we've got Loch Ness, Zurich, Tahoe in the US, Taupo in New Zealand, Lake Ontario in Canada, Lake Titicaca in Bolivia, Lake Malawi in Africa, and then the Sea of Galilee. So we've hit most of the continents and we've hit a lot of different distances. So again, trying to honor what Stephen was doing where it's cold water, it's warm water, it's shallow and windy or not. Um, so I think if people really do take on this challenge that there's going to be some great um, adventures in it from really hard to really easy and well, not really easy. None of those ones are easy. Who, who's going to be first? Oh my God, I don't even know who's going after it on, <laughs> honestly. In some respects, I'm sort of a behind the scenes marathon swimmer. I don't really keep up on all the competitions and the racing that's going out there. I believe um, Pat Shret Gallant, did I do it reversed? I always get her last name reversed the wrong way. I know she's looking at it and I've had some other people reach out to me. Um, honestly, I'd have to go onto the long distance swim database um, that Evan has put together and see who's got what. <laughs> I'm terrible. It's but, your uh, it's your it's your obligation as the organizer of the bucket list to create the competition. No, to no. send like a fake message to Elaine Howley that says you got no chance, Elaine. You know, get get no. you know, <laughs> put the put yeah, the fear see, to somebody. See, for you, Ned and Stephen, you both understand. Like once you create something, if you really want it to take legs and have legs, you you have to brand it and you have to market it and you have to continually write the stories about it. And I think that's one of the things that I didn't realize when we were sitting down in Tarifa having a beer talking about this. Um, I think now that the actual eight are set, and this is the eight, it won't change again, um, and that it's now in the long distance swim database, I think if it, if it takes legs, it's probably going to be more organic. I don't think you're going to see me doing a lot of posting and trying to get the little, you know, competition like, Pat, did you know so-and-so is going over here to get it done? What are you going to do? Um, yeah, I think it's going to be more organic. 
there. And Dave Barra is probably too old to try for at this point. Well, Ned, what about you? <laughs> I, and everyone's like, where are you on this Stillwater 8, Michelle? How many have you completed? And I'm like, uh, none. <laughs> I have any of them, honestly. You, um, you, you were set to uh, to do kind of a, a unique challenge this year, and I'm, or is it next year? Um, and I'm sure COVID's probably wiped it out, but something called the Talisker Whiskey Atlantic Row. Have you been talking um, to Cameron Bellamy by chance? What, what's, what's dragged you into rowing all of a sudden? So you brought this up, and I, if my name's attached to it, I don't think it's correct. Um, I, I don't know about rowing the Atlantic. I have talked, um, there were two friends that I made when I was at uh, the Bos Bosphorus swim, which again, iconic swim. And um, one of them started talking about doing an actual relay swim following uh, more traditional marathon swimming rules where you swim for an hour and rotate. Or I think for this one, he was talking about swimming for two hours and then rotating and having a six man relay swim the rowing route across the Atlantic. And I am contemplating that, but, um, and I have told him I'm interested in it, but there are a few things again that have to come into play. I mean, it's, so it would be doing the rowing route, but doing it swimming with a six man um, relay. And it was, um, I don't think it's off. I think it's just still organizing and uh, trying to get sponsorship at this point. Um, and it sounds, it sounds like it sounds like somebody created a bucket list and now they're marketing and putting people like you under pressure to sign up. I love it. Well, they're like, would you be interested? And I'm like, well, I'm always interested in something <laughs> super crazy and somewhat stupid. They're like, well, we'll be on the boat for two months. And I'm like, okay, for that, um, there's a lot of other things for me. Uh, I mean, my bills have to be paid for that two months. I have dogs. I have, <laughs> I want to make sure my house is still mine when I get back. <laughs> so, I mean, it's more than just being on the boat for two months. It's the logistics of making sure that you have a life and a job and a, a house to come back to. I mean, I, I wish I, I wish I would have won the lottery and I could just, you know, do those things. I unfortunately don't. <laughs> so, so tell us about uh, tell us about life right now. You're located in Portland, Oregon. It's a, yeah. a place a place that seems to be on the news every night, and you're in uh, a place that uh, was an early uh, COVID hotspot in the U.S. What's life yes. been like the past few months? Uh, quiet for me. Um, honestly, I single, two dogs, spending a lot of time alone in the house, uh, sheltering in place. Um, it has given me a lot of time to reflect on how do I want to, like I sort of alluded to, the last five years have been a struggle for me physically and mentally. So it gave me a little bit of pause time to see what do I want to do and how do I want to try and come out of this. Um, so uh, done some thinking there and in the last month when we've started to be able to socially distant and be out and um, there's now more people out walking the riverside um, and it's safe to be out swimming and I finally have two people that I can swim with. That's why I wasn't going out in the winter time. It's just, I would have been swimming by myself and nobody would have been outside. So it's just not a smart decision. I've started getting back in the water um, really, really slow um, and, you know, trying to figure out how to move forward in these weird times that, you know, still connect with the open water swimming community, um, seeing what people are doing, but at the same time trying to be healthy and responsible um, and not swim alone. And I mean, there's so many things that you have to navigate but i'd have to say for the last month it's been going pretty well <laughs> hey, wait, but michelle you, you 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 know the secret right you take the piece of paper you write the goal you go ahead and make all the arrangements and then you figure out how many meters you're going to swim every week between exactly. now and then it's you know it's it's you, 
it's not something you haven't done a few times before now. That is true. That is true. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, under, I was going to be part of a relay that was going to be doing something in the Channel Islands in California. Obviously, most of the organizations have uh, postponed their seasons yeah. uh, for safety. And I mean, even as a board member of the Portland Bridge Swim, we uh, canceled the swim because people just can't get the training in that they need to. And it's financially, it's really difficult to. You know, people need that money back right now. Um, and uh, also, we just didn't want to create a, a group of people um, in one area from a health perspective, which I think is what a lot of the organizations and associations are dealing with. So, um, yeah, so right now it's more just let's go out and get into the river. And ex like you said, Ned, you know, what's right local that we can do and just have fun with without you know, a specific set goal. Um, you know, I go down to the river, I meet a friend and we say, okay, where are we going to swim to today? And it's like, well, let's swim up to the paddle wheeler that's moored over there and that's a 4K swim. Okay, great. Oh, let's try and go to from this city, this dock in this city to this dock in this city and swim back. And that's a two hour swim. And it's you know, so you're just doing more local fun stuff, which is what I really need right now versus the, I'm going to do a double of Lake Tahoe or something like that. I need to, I need to kind of almost go back to the beginning and start small. For the, for the swimmers out there who are frustrated that the events were in, in most cases canceled this year as, as, as organizers, um, certainly, uh, this uh, the health was was a was a big issue, not just not just the traveling swimmer, but you know what happens if a swimmer's in trouble and has to come up on a boat, and everybody looks at each other and goes, I'm not I'm not getting closer to, than six feet to this person that's laying there and needs our, you know respiration. Um, this the second problem is this whole preparation thing, yep. for most organizers, particularly for the big swims, the number one safety protocol is not lots of boats or kayakers it's making sure that the swimmers show up in good physical and mental yep. shape yep. and 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 not being in the pools for months and months didn't help that and then there's also a, a financial uh, you know knock on all of these things in some cases the organizers said well look you know we, we've already spent the money you don't get any back yep. and that that was always popular uh, I think Catalina was quite unique that they said, you can have your money back and we'll even pay your PayPal fees. We just, we just want you not to say bad things about us. And in my particular yeah. case, the people who come to Cork in 2021 get these really cool 2020 COVID caps. <laughs> <laughs> because, oh, and shirts and towels, because guess what? They're all here. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the Portland Bridge Swim, um, we do have in our contract that if we cancel 60 days before you'll get a 50 percent refund but we understood that these times were very different so we looked at what was in our reserves and how much we had already invested in park permits that we couldn't get back and we were able to refund 87 percent of people's deposit and we also um, are offering those people who in 2020 an early registration for 2021 so we're trying to do what we can, but we understood that really um, physically and mentally, people probably weren't going to be coming into the event prepared and mentally needed to be spending their time focusing their energies elsewhere, whether that was with family members or in their own communities. And then some people had taken the financial hit, you know, maybe they were furloughed from their jobs or, you know, work in the restaurant industry or heaven knows so we wanted to try and be respectful and cognizant and responsible about that kind of a decision and i think that's what a lot of the organizations have been trying to do as much as it is you know coming looking at it from a swimmer just being like oh my gosh it just would have provided me an escape from all this craziness in this world right now um but we just felt it wasn't the responsible thing for us at this point so. Well, Michelle, we've, we've about reached the end of the time, so I want to thank you. And for anybody out there listening, 
Poor Michelle has done Ocean 7. She's exhausted her entire bucket list. If you have any ideas of some cool swims that Michelle should do, please just send them on to her. <laughs> and, and I'm sure she'll see her next year. Yeah. Thank you, I Michelle. Have, I have some plans. They're just smaller ones. They're just smaller ones. But of course, if you've got ideas and you've got money for me, send my <laughs> way. <laughs> Take care now. Thanks so much.